Hi, everybody. Let's allow for another two minutes to, for people to join. No, Dirk has not uh, cloned himself. So the second <laughs> instance of Dirk is Dave. Well, the other one looks much better. <laughs> I'm trying to change my name in the chat in the participant list, and it seems you can't. Yeah, I had to do this um, for other ITF uh, meetings. I uh, I had to attend, and um, they didn't want me to join as IC Energy. So, sorry. <laughs> So why was the uh, why was there a WebEx sent out with the, with a different WebEx meeting? That was the one that was in my calendar. I suspect this got auto generated. Um, I'm not sure, or maybe we just had to. Um... All right. Well, um, okay. Toro-san and Yuki-san have joined here, so everybody who was in the other meeting is now back. Okay. Great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um... Let's get started. Um, thanks for making this. Um, we know that everybody has uh, a ton of online meetings uh, these days, so we appreciate um, you being here. Um, yeah, welcome to IC Energy. Um, so this is an interim meeting uh, after IETF uh, 109. Um, so Dave and I are sharing that. Um, so while we do this intro, um, you can already think about um, whether you would be able to help with taking notes today. Um, so we're still looking for a note taker, and it's kind of important. Um, okay, so this is <laughs> the online participation section that not everybody has um, received. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, let's um, let's do the uh, Q and A um, using this protocol. So um, add yourself to the to the queue if you have a question uh, using plus Q. And um, quickly uh, take note of the um, uh, IRTF note well. So um, this has to do with, um, with IPR. And uh, so by participating here, you, are, you agree to follow the IRTF processes. And this is mainly about um, notifying um, the community quickly uh, when you uh, uh, where that um, say IPR relevant topics are discussed that you that, that you know of. Um, we also have a um, privacy and uh, code of conduct, and um, there's also an anti harassment um, procedure. Um, please take note of that and um, yeah, uh, adhere to these um, code of conducts. And then uh, again, as usual, um, we are here in the Internet Research Task Force. So um, we are generally um, interested on longer term research that is related to um, to the Internet, evolving the Internet. And um, so this is clearly research, not um, standardization. And um, sometimes this is irritating because we are using similar um, Procedures or you know concepts on drafts and RFCs. Uh, just be aware that um, we're not doing standards here. Okay, if you're new to this, this is our um, general uh, infrastructure mailing list uh, wiki, wiki page. And um, yeah, so no, I hope everybody has had enough time to think about um, volunteering for taking notes. Do we have anybody? I usually do it, but this time I can't because I'm actually in double duty and I'm waiting for somebody to come repair the, the bell here. So I won't be able to be there all the time. Okay. So yeah, sorry, I mean, but I thought I thought about it and my heart is with it, by the way. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Um, it's also good at, um, time to maybe give somebody else a chance. So you have done it um, quite a lot. Thank you. So 
So this is just about um, recording the conversation, the questions and answers. Um, doesn't require a full recording of the meeting. Okay, let's do something. Um, I'll do it, but I'll listen to. You're recording this, right? We are recording this, right? Okay, so I will do it listening to the recording. Okay, thanks very much. What did you say? Like make make sure that you send me the, the link to the recording, and I have to do coin anyway. I have to help with coin, uh, okay. so I'll do it with the recording uh, over the weekend or something. Okay, I will. And I'll Thanks. try to type some stuff in the coding the MD, um, just so we don't miss anything. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll I'll look at everything. I won't be able to pay attention to taking notes the whole time because I'm involved in a couple of the uh, right. topics. Um, so I I um, went over this a bit quickly. Um, so we have um, this Cody MD link here um, that I also sent around, and you can find it on the data tracker. Um, please. Yeah, already in there. Take yeah. And um, so we are also using this for um, tracking attendance. So um, like, like the online bush sheet. Um, please feel free to add your name to to the list there. Thanks. Okay. And um, so this is uh, the agenda. Let me make this a bit um, So we have a pretty um, exciting agenda today. Um, so many uh, cool research presentations. Um, so just asking, um, is there anything you'd like to change? Any last minute requests? So regarding the timing, uh, you can see it's quite um, ambitious. Um, so you don't have to use all the time uh, in your time slot, of course. Uh, but um, I mean, since this is research, we anticipate discussion. So um, we, we, I mean, we are not constrained by the usual, you know, room bookings or anything else. Okay. Um, just very quickly. Um, so we went through our. Um, um documents in the group and um so here's a quick update um just of the, of the ones that are currently nearing uh, completion and uh well first on uh, firstly um let's celebrate the publication of rc uh, 8884 um research selections for using uh, icn in disaster scenarios um, this had a long time coming but we are happy that it finally got published Thanks again to the authors and everybody who helped uh, getting this done. Um, we have a few other drafts that are um, um, so kind of cycling around the uh, our group and um, the IRSG. And um, so the uh, ICN Lopen draft is also almost uh, finished. Um, so um, I think we are just waiting for the ISD to. Um, Agree that it's ready and uh, we moved on. So this had some we had some vision cycles already. Um, the uh, QoS architecture draft um, is about to be sent for, to the ISG for conflict review. So this is uh, basically out of the um, IRTF. Now um, the these two NRS uh, documents. Um, they also had a few um, cycles, um, so we are I think, waiting for a revision for requirements. And um, conservation is currently in, in IRC review. And then finally, uh, the LTE 4G draft, um, so that also got some comments in the ISG, and um, so waiting for an, for an update um, on that. Um, but um, yeah, so this has been really good um, progress. So despite all the uh, challenges uh, in this year, so thanks everybody for um, um, yeah, keeping doing this. Um, it's it's really great to see um, that this is all moving forward. Um, we have a couple of more documents um, that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, so let's maybe do this on the mailing list. Uh, um, we were also sort on updates and expect some updates of, of um, some of our other documents, um, but let's discuss them on the, on the list. Um, unless there's anything uh, we missed, um, please let us know. Okay, good. 
Um, okay, so um, with that, um, uh, we can start our technical program and um, like to hand it over to Christian. And um, okay. okay, you will second. present the slides. Um, I don't have your slides yet. Oh, I sent it by email. Of course, you were talking. Um, but I can just share them directly. I can just make your presenter, Christian, if you, if you okay. like. Uh, hopefully, I don't lose then my view. It's always a little bit. Uh... Yeah, this is WebEx. You will use your <laughs> lose yeah. the WebEx view. Yeah. So, do you see the slides? Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Good. So let's quickly go to that. It's not really a technical presentation. It's more kind of where we are, what the different positions or views are. A quickly a timeline. It all started uh, with the draft. And I saw uh, Chris is also on uh, the today's meeting. Uh, so where we uh, wrote down that ver very first initial version, uh, it was in the background, some C programming with CC and Lite and getting some experiences on how you program that. Um, then uh, later, uh, Mark and Dave joined. Uh, they have stake in that because I think of the manifest, of course, and the nameless objects needed for CCNX. And that was very welcome uh, to help that uh, draft uh, evolve. And in spring, Mark uh, did some programming and uh, gave another push. A namespace concept came into that. I have collected all the links that he sent in at the end of the slide set. So people interested in the details can look them up there. And I think the most important part to report today is about what happened in August, where we had a lot of discussions. I think it started more or less with a mail by Mark, then Cenk joined in, Ken, and then a lot of ping pong with Dave, Mark, and me. Uh, one of the additional things were that uh, concept of virtual blob suddenly came up. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to see the discussions that really it there is some work still to be done. And I just take took one sample of, uh, of, of a statement, Flick describes a single file. No, by definition, Flick must always describe two files. So we already at the conceptual level or terminology level have to be careful what we are doing here and uh, we need some revisions. So quickly, uh, where we are. Uh, so that is from Dave. Uh, he uh, just uh, sent me that. Uh, there is a disagreement on how basic or how complex, how full, how complete the spec should be, the scope. Uh, there is an agreement that we should have a kind of extension, so future proof uh, pre uh, pro properties. Uh, the namespace thing is mentioned that Mark uh, came up with and uh, metadata capabilities, so you can easily traverse the tree, find things easily in a hash tree. And uh, well, exactly how that metadata machinery would look, that is exactly something to discuss. So uh, we are in the plane of that discussion. I quickly switched to Mark's assessment. I realized uh, he made a contribution in September, options for Flick name constructors, and I think there was no follow up on that. So that is also an ending discussion we should pick up. Uh, on the Flick document itself, uh, similar like Dave, uh, we need name constructors, uh, so that is the name uh, space concept. Uh, the extension of manifests is not really uh, contested. Uh, how the link section should be done, uh, that needs a little bit of discussion, the format. Uh, so the question of uh, if it's not complex or not complex enough, uh, he more says um, the current thing is not too complex, so why not go with that? So that is the state, if I can also add more. Uh, Position. I did a detour recently on looking at uh, existing uh, software called Hypercore, a protocol that is information centric in the decentralized community that has an access protocol. And it has an interesting construction, also using immutable data blocks, hash pointers, signed Merkle trees. Uh, so it has a lot of the elements Flick is about, but they use it differently at a higher level. They build higher level data structures, uh, file systems, for example. And I think we can learn from that. It can inform how the Flick scope should be, how to build, have a building, a, a toolbox to do exactly such high level data structures. So I, of course, I try to get your arguments for a more incremental way 
uh, and maybe decomposition of the Flick document. But that is pending discussions. Uh, there is also, that's not necessarily the, the truth to aim for, to look at hypercore per se, because they don't have really manifest, but it can helpfully help to give a perspective on the discussions we are having. So, uh, summarizing, I think uh, Dave, Mark and me, we definitely agree that we should participate in more of the technical discussions. Uh, I'm not sure about Chris, uh, maybe he can join in, uh, he is now also on that call. Here are all the links, the references, where I think we should continue working. And I would like to invite Dave and Mark to complement what I have said. Uh, so I'll chime in for a second, which is, um, we tend to go in fits and starts on this. So I think our high order goal ought to be to, to freeze something we can push through and get uh, to experimental. Because um, I think the, the lack of something stable is um, probably um, limiting people's interest in actually using manifests in major ways uh, to solve some of the um, you know, perennial problems we have. So I, I th I'd like to sort of try and set a goal of getting this um, through our G last call by mid-January. Uh, I don't know how other people feel about this. So we may wind up taking a bit of an ax to some of the more uh, popular um, fancy things we'd like to do in order to get this through. And remember, since this is an experimental draft and this is a research group, there's no reason why we can't um, you know, uh, move this to multiple versions as long as we get the extensibility and versioning capability right pretty fast. I'm done, by the way. <laughs> yeah, okay. Is Mark joining? Or no, I think he had a time conflict, right? Yeah, Mark couldn't make it, unfortunately. Right. And uh, Chris, do you have uh, something to say here? Uh, nope, this all sounds good. Okay, so I think the, the, the four of us should uh, reconvene and uh, see exactly how to take the axe and do something. Okay. Dirk, is that fulfilling what you had in mind with that status update? Yes, uh, very much. Thank you, Christian. It's okay. great. Welcome. Yeah, so I'd like to chime in that there's no, you know, we're not, this isn't a design team in the sense that other people are not encouraged to uh, join us in working on the technical aspects of this, right? We're, we're, we are not oversubscribed in people's input by any stretch of the imagination. So folks, please take a look at the, you know, the notes and the draft and you have ideas to, um, uh, to contribute and uh, particularly help on um, solidifying the draft. That's obviously something we would very much appreciate. Okay, great, thanks. Edmund, um, shall I make you presenter? What okay? Sure. Sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> so, should work now. Okay. So, I don't see a share button yet. Um, should should appear on on, on the button. Toolbar next to stop video. And I think okay, you let's see. All I have to do is try um, a. Uh, um, So I have to adjust the system setting here. Yeah, yeah. Take your time.
Okay, I just allowed it, but it still doesn't show me the button for some reason. Hmm. Okay. Um. Webex thinks you are presenter. Yeah, I mean, it tell, tells me the open system preferences, and then I changed it, and then it's still not giving me the choice to share the screen. Let's see. Uh, is it a permission issue, perhaps? That's right. Um, I just gave it permission, I think. But... Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe we should just <clears throat> have, I mean, if you might, if you don't mind driving the, the slides, I, I don't want to hold everybody up. Um, sure, I can do it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so, um, so I, I have the, um, the uh, bullets come in uh, sequentially, but you can just basically like hit all the bullets in one page, have them show up at the same time. So we don't have to, um, yeah, sorry about this. But Dirk, can you enlarge the the slide space? It comes up very small on my screen. I don't know if it's everyone. Yeah, thank you. Small font for old I eyes. Up to 5K. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, is that big enough for everyone? So I can't see it. You have to tell me if it's too small. Okay, I mean, it's fine for me. Okay. All right, so it's very nice to be, sorry, uh, it's very nice to be a part of uh, this discussion. Thanks for inviting me, um, Dave and Dirk. So um, this is about um, uh, a few projects which uh, have, uh, two projects actually, which have uh, been taking place the last couple of years on uh, using um, data centric. Um, approaches to look at data intensive science uh, areas. And uh, so this encompasses a lot of very important science areas such as uh, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, this is for high energy physics, which has uh, been responsible for many famous discoveries, including Higgs boson, for instance, and many Nobel Prize uh, discoveries. Uh, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is another application that uh, is uh, going to be the next big thing in uh, astronomy. Uh, Scare Kilometer Array is another um, project in astronomy, astrophysics. Uh, genomics is another application. So these are uh, all scientific uh, domains um, and uh, applications which involve many scientists around the world involving enormous data volumes and uh, have uh, very common needs in terms of uh, data, data delivery, um, distributed computation. Um, and uh, what uh, these projects are about is uh, using a data-centric uh, approach to solving these uh, big data-intensive problems within these areas. So next, please. <clears throat> so, these data intensive applications face a similar set of problems. So in, I mentioned there's high energy physics, LSST, LIGO is gravity wave genomics. <clears throat> so the system challenges having to do with um, how to index data, how to secure the data, uh, how to store the data, how to distribute the data, how to analyze the data, uh, and how to learn from the data. Uh, so these are very common themes that run through all of these different areas. And uh, all of these things, uh, these uh, tasks, uh, these uh, problems have to be, uh, ta tasks have to be accomplished using uh, coordinated use of computing storage and network resources. And um, these resources, while they are uh, getting more abundant, they're still limited. And the rate at which the data volume is increasing is still far su surpassing uh, the, the rate at which these resources are, are increasing. So now what's happening right now, um, and after, of course, uh, collaborating with many people in uh, the physics area and also now starting in the genomics area, uh, we found that um, these different domains are dealing with similar problems. However, they're 
basically solving their own solving their own problems in isolation, more or less. Uh, each of these domains is developing their own solutions, which tend to be incremental because these experts are not networking experts. Uh, they're domain science experts. And a lot of efforts tend to be replicated across these different domains. And uh, one may ask why that is, uh, why we have this problem that uh, uh, you have this replication of efforts and incremental solutions. Um, part of the problem I think that uh, uh, one can identify is this gap which exists between the application needs and the existing networks and systems. And uh, so I don't think I need to convince people here that uh, we have this gap and uh, and the applications are really care about, uh, they're really caring about the data, whereas the networks and systems tend to focus on how, uh, addresses, processes, servers, connections, and the security solutions also focus on securing the data containers and delivery pipes. And so because of this, of this gap, uh, be, these domain experts have to basically cook up their own ad hoc solutions uh, to, need, to meet their data needs um, given uh, their existing systems. And this has caused to, uh, this kind of uh, uh, situation that we have today. Uh, next, please. So uh, what we're taking, uh, what we're doing in these projects is to take a data centric approach to a system and network design and providing system support uh, through the whole data lifecycle from the production of the data, uh, naming the data, securing the data directly to delivering the data uh, using names uh, and enabling in-network caching, for instance, is the one uh, is a very big uh, uh, key functionality that's required by these applications. Automated uh, joint caching and forwarding, uh, multi multicast delivery, all of those things which are enabled by a data-centric approach. And the key is that we're trying to adopt a common framework to support these different application domains. Come up with a common structure and um, way of looking at things so that these uh, different uh, domains can uh, can draw from this framework and build systems which can meet their needs. And uh, so this, of course, is is uh, has been uh, has been motivated and inspired by uh, NDN project. Uh, next, please. So so we got to into this a couple of years ago um, when uh, Harvey Newman, who's uh, a very well, um, uh, a very uh, well established and well connected physicist, high energy physicist at Caltech, um, actually approached me because they, he had heard of NDN and uh, said, you know, why don't we try to uh, use NDN to speed up things in the high energy physics network? So this was a, a great opportunity, and uh, you know, we started collaborating and. Uh, we applied for this project, which was uh, thankfully it was uh, funded by the NSF back in 2017 called uh, Sandy, SDN Assisted NDN for Data Intensive Experiments. So the PIs were myself, uh, Harvey Newman, and uh, Christos Papadopoulos at Colorado State. Uh, and then uh, because he had gone to DHS, uh, that the project was uh, taken over by Craig Partridge. And this project has been, um, I think, uh, very fruitful. And it has been supported with by the um, other LHC sites in Har the LHC sites and as well as the NDN project team. So the approach here is to use um, NDN to redesign the LHC uh, Large Hadron Collider High Energy Physics Network to, and to try to optimize the workflow. Uh, in, so what are the main things we did? Uh, we developed an NDN naming scheme for fast access and efficient communication in HEP and, and, and extensible to other fields. We deployed NDN edge caches with SSD as multiple, at multiple sites, which are connected to the high energy physics network. And we looked at simultaneous optimization of caching uh, of hot data sets and uh, forwarding hot data sets or data sets with which a, a lot of uh, different scientists tend to access in the high energy physics uh, network. Uh, next, please. So what are the results from Sandy? So this has been going on for a few years. Um, the feasibility of an NDN-based data distribution system for LHC was first demonstrated at SC, the Supercomputing Conference in 2018, 
where we actually demonstrated a system which had a redirector from the system which directs requests within the HEP network called XRUD. Uh, it redirected these um, XRUD requests to an NDN based system, which would deliver the data back. And uh, so that was demonstrated in, at, at SC18. In SC19 last year, um, we showed a, a great, greatly improved throughput and delay performance. And uh, it had uh, three major components in the implementation. One is the uh, the joint uh, caching and forwarding algorithm uh, that uh, we developed in Northeastern called VIP. Uh, we actually uh, uh, coded that up and implemented it within the uh, this uh, high energy physics uh, network or this test bed network that we put together. Uh, we also in, uh, integrated that with the high speed NDNDBDK forwarder developed by NIST. Uh, and uh, that they actually developed, finished the development very shortly before the uh, SC19. It was uh, quite a, a development effort to integrate these two things, uh, but uh, thankfully that was uh, successful. Uh, and then there was an NDNDBDK based consumer and producer, uh, which was developed by Caltech. Uh, or also around that time. So all three components were put together uh, for this demo. And this demo took place over a transcontinental layer two demo test bed, which ran from the SC19 demo floor uh, to Caltech Northeastern and Colorado State. So this involved, uh, of course, working with a lot of partners in internet to ESnet and uh, Scenic and so forth to just put together these VLANs uh, at layer two to put, and this in itself, of course, required a lot of work. Um, so this was an actual demo over a wide area network uh, live uh, demonstration. Um, and it was taking place, you know, in, with two NSF PM sitting right in front of us. So we really had to make it work and thankfully it did. Um, so we achieved over 6.7 gigabits per second throughput. Uh, uh, this is a single thread implementation between uh, the Indian DBDK based consumer and producer over the West wired area network using um, using NDN. And uh, we also, uh, so that was the throughput uh, performance. Um, we also uh, used the, the optimized caching forwarding algorithms to decrease download times by a factor of 10. Um, so this this was a, a quite, a, a, quite a, a success from our point of view after a few years of uh, development and implementation. And integration. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so this is just a screenshot of the throughput which we obtained. So if you could look at the uh, left, uh, uh, upper left hand uh, corner there, you see the 6.71 uh, gigabits per second. This was uh, photographed on uh, the floor there. Um, next, please. And then one quick, real quick question. Yes. At 6.7 gigabits, what was the bottleneck? The bottleneck. Um, yeah, I think the the bottleneck was uh, I think the forwarder basically. I mean, the forwarder. Um, if if the this performance is very much in line with the uh, you know what the the forwarder performance that was uh, obtained by NIST uh, in their uh, in their test bed uh, using of course they went to multi-threaded implementations which increased the throughput linearly actually with the number of threads. So here was this was a single threaded uh, implementation. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yes. So yeah, so that was Sandy, um, and uh, that was uh, Sandy is actually still running in its last extension year. But um, uh, just this um, uh, October, uh, we received another grant uh, from the NSF called Andes. Andes. It's called Andes, uh, like the Andes Mountains. Uh, in the end for data intensive science experiments. Uh, so this, um, you could look at it basically as an extension of, of the follow on to, uh, to Sandy because Sandy is, is ending. So now uh, the team is uh, with Northeastern uh, with uh, myself as being PI, uh, Caltech, uh, Harvey again, uh, and UCLA where Lisha and uh, Jason Song, uh, Jason Kong are the co-PIs and uh, at Tennessee Tech, uh, Susmit Shanagrahi, who has become faculty there recently um, and formerly was with uh, Christos at Colorado State is a co-PI. And uh, 
So what is this new project about? Well, it's about uh, basically pushing the envelope further uh, on this project. Uh, so we have big challenges coming up for LHC. Uh, LHC data volumes are to grow 10 times uh, due to high luminosity LHC, which is coming in 2027. We also have greatly increased data complexity due to that high luminosity experimentation. Um, we also, uh, this project is also going to uh, look at the genomic applications, uh, the human genome data and the earth biogenome data is also is hitting the exabyte range. Okay. Um, and also in this project, we're going to focus more on uh, the fact that we have to need, need to use diverse com computation storage and networking resources. Uh, basically, have to use everything that we have to accomplish the task we want to, we want to accomplish in these applications. So the approach is to build a data centric ecosystem to provide uh, agile, integrated, interoperable, scalable, robust, and trustworthy. Uh, that's a lot of words there for heterogeneous uh, data intensive domains. Um, so let's uh, talk about some of these things that we're, which we're going to do. Uh, next, please. So the goal is to deploy and commission the first prototype production ready NDN based petascale data distribution caching access computation system serving major science programs um, with the LHC high energy physics program as the leading target use case. And with biogenome human genome projects. Um, uh, as well as the LSST SKA uh, projects as being future uh, use cases. We're going to leverage NDM protocols, high throughput forwarding caching methods, and containerization techniques, uh, and integrated with the SDN, some of the SDN methods that uh, Harvey has been working on, uh, and as well as FPGA acceleration subsystems, where Jason Kong has a lot of expertise. So this is um, it's got a lot of uh, ingredients uh, that would uh, would make the, the system much more high performing. Uh, the goal is to deliver LHC data over a wide area network at throughputs near 100 gigabits per second, and dramatically decrease download times by using optimized caching. And we're going to have an enhanced test bed. So this is going to build on the Sandy test bed with with more. Uh, NDN data cache servers for to fill out the uh, the Andes uh, test bed. Uh, next, please. So some of the research agenda, just to uh, be a little bit more specific, um, we're going to so in order to increase the throughput towards 100 gigabits per second, uh, we're going to look at um, multi-threaded consumer and producer applications uh, and aim for linear throughput scaling. Uh, and this was evidenced by the experiments at NIST on the DPDK forwarder. And of course, now we have to build the consumer producer applications as well as look at the um, multi-threaded versions of the caching algorithm, caching and forwarding algorithms, combined caching and forwarding algorithms. Um, we're going to look at containerization uh, in order to uh, for to deal with diverse equ uh, server equipment and interfaces. Uh, specifically to use Docker containers to host guest OSs for state restoration uh, to ease upgrading. We're also going to look at data integrity and provenance. So as an immediate goal, we're, we're going to look at data origin authentication. So in these high energy physics applications and these data science uh, applications, uh, security um, is uh, not a foremost consideration at the moment because they basically um, keep access to these systems uh, to be uh, very restricted. You have to apply and you wait a long time to get approved. Uh, once you get in the system, you're in the system. Um, but I think uh, the, the authentication of the data is still extremely important. And so we're going to start with that and uh, look at the use of data manifests uh, to for uh, uh, data authentication, uh, which is something that NDN, of course, is, is very good at. So we're going to start with that. Later on, as we go along with the uh, with the project, and later in the project, we uh, we could also we would also possibly look at provenance tracing, which is the uh, the 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 idea that uh, data is going to be you know the output data of the one researcher might be used as the input data for the next researcher, and so and so it's very important to uh, trace the, the provenance of the data. But that's going to come uh, later in the project, uh, and it possibly. Um, Next, please. 
We're also going to look at congestion control and retransmission. This is something that Sandy did not have uh, that, that we're uh, that we're going to actively look, look uh, actively look at. And, and there's of course a lot of uh, things to draw on in, in that respect from NDN. We're going to look at uh, multi-threaded uh, caching forwarding, optimized caching forwarding for the BIP algorithm. And we're going to look at hierarchical caching systems uh, because of the data volume that's present in these applications. Um, it's just not practical to simply look at RAM. So one has to look at all kinds of storage one could get your hands on uh, economically. And that involves um, SSDs, uh, Intel Optane, et cetera. Uh, and, but then, of course, all of these have different uh, read, read and write speeds. So they have different uh, uh, durability and so forth. So uh, one has to um, take that into account in any kind of caching algorithm. Uh, that one develops. So we're going to actively look at that. And then we're going to look at, as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned on uh, FPGA acceleration. So uh, these are, of course, being used. Uh, they've been suggested that it, that it be used for, uh, for uh, forwarding, name-based forwarding in NDN. Uh, but we have a specific way we're going to use it here in this project. Uh, basically, in the NDN DPDK forwarder, there are these uh, there are these tables which are used, the, the name dispatch table, the uh, combined PIT CS uh, uh, composite table, and the FIB. And a lot of these uh, lookup functions uh, and the hash functions uh, will be accelerated using FPGAs. Uh, and uh, Jason Kong is going to lead the effort uh, in doing that. We're very help hopeful that this, this FPG acceleration can give us a lot of performance boost. Uh, in this case. Next, please. All right, so just to conclude here, um, this was kind of a, um, a really short tour of what we've been doing. So um, uh, data intensive science applications require fundamental networks and system solutions to address very common needs. And we believe that uh, NDN provides a, a data centric system support uh, through this whole data life cycle is a, is a very good fit for data intensive science as a natural fit for LHC genomics and other data intensive applications. Uh, we have shown in the Sandy project already a high performance, uh, high performing NDN system uh, with a throughput of uh, 6.7 gigabits per second uh, demonstrated live on the, on the, on the, at the uh, SC19 uh, using the NDN DPDK forwarder as well as the VIP uh, optimized caching forwarding. And with the new project Andes, uh, we're going toward the first prototype production ready Indian system uh, integrated with uh, FPGA containerization uh, with support of SDN operations that Caltech has been looking at. And um, we're very, um, we're very uh, hopeful that we can build a very good system for high energy physics, genomics, and uh, by leveraging that, we seek long-term collaboration with other domain sciences uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, to develop this common framework, which would, which would work for these data-intensive applications uh, and work with uh, many other communities. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Edmund. Super exciting. Are there any questions? We have a question on the traffic uh, style that we will be using NDIs. Is that uh, elastic or inelastic? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, we're going to look at congestion control as a part of the system. Um, so, you know, I, I assume that's what you mean by elastic. In, in, I mean, so the, it's in these um, high energy physics um, networks. Um, it is it is definitely possible to to control the input rate in the sense that uh, you know basically slow down requests if the network gets congested. That's what happens uh, in practice. Um, and um, so uh, I, I think the system is elastic basically um, because the uh, delays actually which are being tolerated on the system is way too big actually <laughs> sometimes on the order of you know, hours and, you know, days. Uh, so, because these are really large um, jobs. And so, um, I would probably characterize it as elastic. Um, so, 
I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, exactly. So it is mostly on the content delivery network uh, facets that you play yeah. in the game. Yeah, um, okay. so it's actually, um, it's not only a content delivery network, it's also a computation network because you have these computation and analysis jobs that are done over this network. So actually there's a lot more going on than just content delivery. Um, we're focusing on the content delivery um, as of now, but um, there is actually a, a much bigger problem of how to you know, um, place the computations, how to deliver the data and simultaneously place the computations. Um, that's actually the real underlying big problem. Thank you. Did you see um, Ken's question in the chat? Oh. What see. is the structure of the data? Single files? And are you doing anything interesting with that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, so, um, yeah, I didn't have time to go into the structure of the data too much. So, they, it's kind of um, hierarchically structured. Uh, there are the uh, uh, big data sets, uh, and then there are, uh, so unfortunately, I can't share my screen right now. I actually had a slide on the, on the, on the data. So, there are data sets, there are um, data blocks, and then there are files, and then there are events. Uh, which um, they're kind of organized hierarchically. And there is actually a big problem in the sense of, uh, you know, at what resolution, at what granularity you want to do uh, the, the caching and forwarding, uh, for instance, and the caching is specific, specifically. And we actually did a lot of study as to um, what, what granularity we wanted to work with. And it has a lot to do with um, the popularity distribution, how fast it falls off at different granularities. And uh, we we found that at the data block level was where this um, the uh, fall off was was very desirable, meaning you could track a relatively small number of data blocks and be able to capture most of the popularity. So that's where we kind of the caching algorithms were designed for. And um, uh, did we do anything interesting with names? Um, uh, so, for the high energy physics application, actually, there is a very straightforward, uh, they already have a very um, well established hierarchical naming scheme. And the nice thing about high energy physics is that it's a naming scheme which everybody kind of agrees with. And because it's a very hierarchical system, and because all the data is generated by essentially one location, which is CERN, right? So, and, and so it's not a situation where you, know, you have many different producers of data. So, um, so there's a relatively straightforward translator which you can build, which translates from um, high energy physics names to NDN based names. Um, so, in that sense, it's not interesting, but uh, it's also you know very good that we have something like that. If, and now, in the genomics application, it's quite different, uh, and that's what one of the situations we're uh, very um, uh, interested in and also challenged by, which is that in the genomics case, you have static. Uh, static data, but you also have a lot of dynamic data, uh, which is being generated by different players around the world, and they may have uh, very different naming schemes. And so, um, how do we do real time discovery of new data sets? Um, and how do we adapt, you know, the forwarding and the caching and all those functionalities in this kind of situation um, is a real challenge. Um, so, um, you know, Susmit um, has been working with various uh, collaborators in the genomics area, and uh, he's going to be a key person on this team to uh, to take what we have and to uh, to generalize it to the genomics application. Hmm. So one, ah, okay, question by Eve. Um... Uh, so, yes. Um, so Eve asks, can you share more about what kinds of computation you place in or throughout the network? Uh, <clears throat> so um, there are actually all kinds of computations that go on in these networks because, um, so raw data is actually something that is, you know, the vast majority of the raw data is actually uh, thrown away. It's, it's not kept around because just too many, too much data. And so there's all kinds of initial processing that goes on. Uh, and so there are various stages. After the initial processing, there's further processing and people use, um, even though they're using the same data, uh, process data, they, they use their own algorithms, of course, to, um, to, to hunt for, for particles, right? So, um, so there's a lot of 
compute different types of computation that you would have to do um, over over the network. And usually, you know, you have to schedule a certain amount of time on some server, and then you have to pull the data set, and then you have to run it. So all of this actually is being coordinated in in within this high energy physics network, you know, by clever people, but they're not designed using, you know, using networking, uh, sort of fundamental networking principles necessarily. So, um, so I think the answer is, is basically that there are all kinds of computation going on there. There, there is, there are filtering operations, there are learning operations, there are inference operations uh, that are happening and they're being run by different people and they're all different algorithms and they have to be situated in different uh, places in the network. So it's actually a very, um, it's very um, interesting and challenging problem. Um, but just the data delivery part um, is currently what we're focusing on, but that's already a, a big piece of the puzzle. Okay, great. Good. Thanks again, Edmund. Very nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Um, so next we have uh, Namsong Kyo on a broker based pub sub system for NDN. And uh, I try to make a presenter again. Let's see. Oh, that works. Okay. Do you have a share button? Yeah, I can see the share button. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, this is uh, Nam Sokko from Atri, Korea, and I'm so happy to introduce our research resort here in ICNRG. Actually, there are several people involved in this project, and I present um, this representing them. The title is a, a broker-based pop sub system for NDN. Okay. And here's the motivation. The first one is that uh, there are just few pops of techniques for NDN, uh, and and the most well known one is based on uh, partial sync mode or, or pit sync, where you can just allow subscribers to request data periodically with long lived interest. But the problem is that they are not that scalable, and I wouldn't go much deta detail on that part here at all. But uh, they are not scale scalable enough, and they are mostly um, can used in enterprise network. And they are uh, limited, especially in low powered IoT devices. The devices cannot handle a lot of subscribers at the same time. And the second issue is that they are not flexible as in IP based approaches. Um, for example, wildcard topic matches are not supported in them. So we wanted to design a uh, flexible and scalable pop sub architecture for NDN. So based on the, uh, the problem statement in the previous slide, we uh, set up the design uh, directions. Um, first, in order to cope with uh, issues on the low power, uh, low performance producers, we took the broker-based approach, which is commonly used in uh, IP network. And to support uh, scalability, we considered uh, multiple brokers. And also to support uh, flexibility, uh, MQTT-like wildcard topping matches are supported, uh, such as a single level wildcard uh, plus a sign and multi-level wildcard uh, shop sign. And you can say that the topics are uh, defined by uh, subscribers because uh, producers uh, just publish data with their names and subscribers uh, select their topic based on the published data names. So we can say that uh, topics are, are just defined by subscribers in our design. So in our architecture, we use multiple brokers, uh, which are also called as uh, Landev uh, nodes. They do the brokering of publishers and subscribers, as the names indicate. 
uh, they also store published data uh, for limited uh, performance publishers. Uh, data can also be uh, stored in uh, devices themselves and other external repositories according to the configuration. And published data names are managed by a distributed hash table, DHT, on, on those brokers. We uh, separated uh, topic management and data management uh, logically. Uh, they can be uh, co-hosted on the same physical nodes. In a topic RN, which we call a uh, topic RN, a, a topic tree is managed and in a uh, managed in in topic RN and in a data data RN, data manifest and data uh, parse are managed. Um, Topic uh, manifest, which is given as a result of a search of a uh, top tree, includes the information on RNs, which manage data manifest. And the data manifest uh, stores information about where the data is actually uh, located. So we can find more uh, information when you go over the, the signal flows um, in, in the following slide. A uh, service prefix uh, RN uh, is used for this service, pop-up service in this design, and any publishers and subscribers can uh, reach the uh, nearest broker uh, using the name. And also, each broker has its own own uh, name. Uh, RN X X is an, a, a number. Using the number, a specific RN can be reached. We defined uh, the following name scheme like this uh, for data. Uh, data stream uh, name comes first and, and then uh, sequence number uh, is followed. For example, um, for the temperature in room uh, 385 in building seven in that tree, uh, there is the stream name, data stream name, and for the data stream name, you can uh, publish uh, in data with the sequence number. And for the sequ of command, uh, service prefix uh, comes first. Um, I mean, this one, RN, comes first, and uh, command. Command will uh, be followed. Uh, the command will be uh, explained in the next slide. And the data name uh, is followed by that, I mean, after that. So, for example, RN comes first, and PAP is, uh, is pub um, published ad advertisement. I will just explain that in the next slide and the name uh, for the data. Um, we uh, defined uh, the several protocol messages. Um, uh, there, are, there are also comments. So to publish, uh, publish data, publish advertisement, PA, they can, uh, it can advertise the name of a data stream to publish and publish on advertisement. Uh, it can cancel the publish of a data stream and publish data, it can actually publish a data itself. And subscribe, uh, in the subscribe procedure, um, subscribe topic subscription, the, the name is a little weird, but it will subscribe uh, to topic, to request a topic man uh, manifest, and topic manifest will uh, include a list of data, RN, holding subscribe uh, data streams. And subscribe manifest request, uh, it'll, it'll request a data manifest uh, to a specific data RN. And it'll, the data manifest will include data names for a data stream. And then the last one is the subscribe data request. Subscribe data request, it will request the data itself to a specific data RN. So um, each procedure will uh, be explained step by step. Uh, so that is the logical separation of topic management and data management. And there are multiple publishers here and multiple uh, brokers. Uh, even if they are logically separated here, but uh, those are, uh, actually can be uh, co-hosted on, on the same uh, physical machine. And then uh, publisher one, and two and three will publish data uh, with this topic name, topic two, topic one A, topic one B. And when the publisher one uh, will, 
advertise this topic name, then uh, the nearest RN, RN1 here in this case, uh, will hash the topic, topic two. If it, if it is hashed, then uh, actually it'll indicate that the, the topic RN is RN1. And for this one, it'll uh, be topic RN4. And also for this one, uh, after the hash, uh, it'll uh, be topic one, uh, topic uh, RM4 as well. So, so um, okay. Question. Okay, my go finish page. Okay. Okay. Can I go? So um, when the the messages uh, arrive uh, to the topic RN, then uh, the topic RN will manage uh, topic three based on the names. So in this case, topic two, and topic two is uh, is actually um, came from RN one. And here, if you just, if you see this topic three, then topic one A is uh, from RN two, and topic one A B is uh, from RN four. So I already explained that uh, publisher, I mean, in this case, two publisher, publisher two will advertise the the data stream, this data stream, and if it hash uh, topic one, then it'll indicate RM four for the topic management. So it'll arrive to uh, RM four. Then in RM four, it'll insert uh, the name into topic three. So here in this case, topic one A is included uh, included. Um, as I mean, came from RN2. And uh, advertisement is also very similar. Uh, beside, it is, uh, it will delete the topic, um, the name from the topic tree. And after it is uh, advertised, um, then real data will be published. So from each publisher, It'll uh, I mean publish data. So the first uh, from this topic two, the first uh, sequence, the first data will be published. So it will be published to publish it uh, to RN one because it is uh, near uh, RN one is the nearest one to uh, pub I mean, pub one. So um, in RN one, it will um, uh, update data many manifest. I mean, and also uh, data uh, can be stored. Um, actually, we uh, have several options. Data can be uh, stored here in uh, RN, uh, or data can be uh, still be located in uh, publishers. And also, uh, if there are some other um, external repository systems, then it can also be stored uh, in the external repositories. Uh, so, the data manifest will um, have the information. Data is actually uh, will be stored here. So um, and and also in this case, the first sequence number is uh, was arrived. So it has the information on the data here. On other uh, RS, uh, they also do the uh, similar uh, I mean uh, uh, similar works when the, the data uh, are published. So data are stored and data manifest files for the topics updated in each RN. As I said, data can be stored or data can be stored uh, in other uh, I mean areas like in the devices or the external repositories. Uh, for the small data, uh, they uh, we uh, actually um, included uh, data in the uh, interest interest for the small data but uh, if the files are large then um, data is just published to RN then RN will pull the data so we have two uh, separate uh, approaches for different file sizes and then if the files uh, data there are uh, published it then um, a subscriber can uh, subscribe to the topic so in this case uh, a subscriber one it'll subscribe to topic one 
uh, with wildcard shop. So uh, it actually it can include topic one A or B, or if there's C, then uh, C can be also included. But in this case, uh, there are only two uh, topics, uh, I mean, two data names, uh, data streams uh, were published. So topic one and topic, uh, topic one A and topic one B are uh, only included for this topic. So when the topic subscribe uh, subscription is uh, is sent to the uh, sent to RN, then it will also hash uh, hash the topic. So it just know that the topics are managed in topic RN four. Then it will uh, pass the topic manifest, and the topic manifest will uh, have the information uh, about um, uh, the each topic, like topic one A and topic one B. So topic one A is uh, is is managed in RM two, and topic one B is managed in RM four. So this is a procedure. You can see that as well. And after receiving the topic, uh, I mean data manifest, and it'll uh, request the real data to RN two and RN four. So it'll request uh, RN topic one A, one uh, A, and topic one B to RN four, RN two and four. Actually, after uh, re retrieving data manifest, after retrieving data manifest uh, in the data manifest, uh, it has uh, uh, information on the data. So, uh, in this case, for uh, in for data for uh, topic one A, uh, already um, three actually from one to three, uh, three uh, data were published. So it can pass uh, from one to three uh, from subscriber one. The same to uh, the the RM four, and it is explained. It is very uh, understandable, and yeah, it uh, requests the data as I sent after based on the uh, the information on the data may passed. And uh, this is the software uh, functional blocks. Um, I think I don't need to go uh, over. Uh, the details on these uh, uh, blocks, but we have we implemented uh, our prototype uh, using Python. So there are many uh, utilities. So topic management and topic can be also managed in try or um, just press uh, like uh, I mean like X expression uh, approach. And there are other utilities, and data can also be um, managed in memory or uh, Redis or repo outside. I mean, external repo. And um, this software will be uh, open to the public soon uh, after we uh, clean up the uh, software. I mean, even if we, we uh, finished uh, most of the software, but after cleaning up some. Uh, I mean, bugs and uh, I mean, clean up the source, then we'll open the source to the public. And this is a demo. I think uh, it, it is a little bit I mean, small, but I think I hope you can uh, see this. There are three uh, brokers in this case, three brokers, and this one is, is publisher, and this one is subscriber. And publisher is attached or or is near to uh, broker one, and this subscriber is near to broker two. So after starting uh, three brokers, then the publish uh, publish procedure will start. So in this case. Um, I mean, two name streams, uh, streams will be published, like uh, at 370, room uh, 385, temp, and at 370, uh, room 215, temp. So two streams will be published. So if it is published, then actually the message will be uh, arrived in in broker one, because uh, broker one is the nearest one. And 
It will advertise messages. So the after advertising the first uh, data stream, you can see uh, data stream was arrived, uh, arrived here. And then after hashing the, the topic, uh, it, it will decide the topic has to be managed in RN3 here. So the message is uh, uh, delivered to RN3 to, so that the RN3 can manage the topic here. The same um, for the, the second uh, data stream at 370 uh, room 215 temp. So if you uh, check the status, you can uh, also um, provide some uh, utilities to check the, the three um, topic management uh, status and data management status in each uh, client. So you can check um, data uh, two streams uh, were advertised and the, the two streams are managed in broker two, broker one. Okay, then. Then if it published data, so three data uh, will be published. So it just arrived here. So three uh, data uh, were, uh, arrived here. Then the three data will be um, stored in broker one. And also uh, data manifest uh, uh, main space file uh, was up updated here. For the, se uh, the second um, data name, so we can check the seeders and uh, uh, one data uh, stream was published. And for the second data stream, uh, we also published three data. Then we can also check that uh, the two data stream was, uh, stream was were published. So actually, um, the, all the data uh, were stored here in broker one, and the data um, in topic uh, will be managed in uh, broker three. So after we published data here, then uh, we'll run a subscriber procedure. So after running the subscriber, okay. Okay. Oops. So, okay. So before uh, running uh, my subscription, uh, we can check the status. So we uh, could see the same result as you can see uh, in the broker one. I mean, uh, uh, publisher one. So two data stream were uh, published. So you can subscribe to at 37D uh, with help. So all the uh, data streams uh, with, I mean, this uh, prefix at 37D to uh, 15 and 3385 uh, temperatures uh, will be um, subscribed. So it patched it, uh, the, the topic manifest. So in the topping manifest, uh, you, can, you can see uh, those two streams uh, managed in RN1. So to uh, RN1, it will cast data manifest. So um, after patching the data manifest, they can check. Uh, you can check uh, checks that uh, check that uh, it has. Um, I mean, three uh, data uh, data for each data stream. So for this stream, it has three um, data from one to three in sequence number. The same uh, to this data stream. So then it'll uh, retrieve the data. So we can check the actually um, 
check the temperature here, 30, uh, 3, uh, 33 and 29. So uh, there's the uh, simple demonstration. And as I said, um, this code will be published soon. So we'll announce that uh, through the uh, mailing list to this ICNRG and also Indian community uh, soon. So in summary, uh, we um, developed a uh, broker-based pops up uh, system for NDN, and we argue that it is scalable and flexible than existing um, NDN mechanism, I mean, uh, existing approaches. And we're gonna release our code as open source software soon. So that's it, any questions? Great. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for bringing uh, your work to IC Energy and um, doing this nice, nice uh, demo. Um, so you already have a few questions in the chat. Um, I'm not sure you can see that. Okay, let me check that. Okay. I see. Um, so the first one I can read it um, to you. It's by Dave. Um, so how is deletion accomplished? Um, so by republishing uh, a topic manifest without the data that you want to delete? And are you using manifest versions for that? No, we'll just, uh, I mean, as you can see in the uh, advertisement. So this is the uh, published on advertisement. It will um, use the same uh, approach like, um, RLN, then the command published on advertisement and the name for that. Then it'll also has uh, the same way. So it will know the the topic is managed in, in certain RN, then it'll um the message will be delivered to the the, the RN which manages the topic, then um it'll search the topic tree um using the name, then it'll remove uh, the the topic from the tree. Is okay. it answered? Can you see the questions or? Um... Yeah, I, I see that. Then okay. the second one, where is that? How, um, how are subscribers notified if there's uh, new data in the brokers? How are subscribers notified that uh, uh, there's new data in the brokers? So actually, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, most of you already know that, I mean, in NDN approach or in ICN approach, it is uh, pool-based. So we have to check that uh, periodically if we want to, I mean, know there are new uh, data. So we have to check uh, periodically. Okay. And the next one is brokers introduce the central uh, central list again does a uh, fragile element into the system. Can it not be a broker? That is to make it a peer to peer system. Would this be able to survive a network partition? I guess, I mean, I think uh, we can, um, I mean, uh, if you generalize this approach, then yeah, as you can, as you said, it, you may uh, make each node as a broker node, like, I mean, many, uh, I mean, you can extend uh, this, like a uh, IPFS or something like that, then I, I think, uh, yeah, we can think about uh, that way. Uh, we can fully uh, decentralize uh, the, the brokers in that way. And then, okay. Yeah, so that's my uh, my question. So uh, in the beginning, you said um, you are aiming for a more scalable approach than, for example, um, P-Sync. Yeah, P-Sync. So, so it, that's, a, that's a broad claim, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I mean that uh, I if I have to explain uh, more detail on on P-Sync, I thought it'll um, I mean it'll take some time. So I didn't do that. But in P-Sync, uh, for example, in P-Sync, uh, they are using uh, uh, Bloom filter actually in the name. So, I mean, uh, I think it can uh, I mean make it uh, I mean big enough. Uh, I mean uh, the name you can make the name big enough using the Bloom filter. But I think there is a limitation on that uh, first. So we cannot I mean 
extend the name uh, uh -huh, okay. unlimitedly. So there is the first uh, scale of the issue, and also um, even if it is the partial sync, I think yeah, there is the first one, I guess. Okay, thanks. And the next one is uh, on slide 17. It seems that it is uh, requesting a manifest need to parse the manifest and then need to request the individual segments, right? How is that defined, uh, defined as subscribing? Does it then automatically receive subsequent data in 17? So in 17, Requesting a manifest uh, need to parse the manifest, that's right. And then need to request the individual segments, that's right. How is that defined as uh, subscri subscribing? Because uh, it subscribed, it uh, subscribed the data manifest. We call that uh, as subscription. We, I mean, uh, we uh, received the, the subscription, I mean, the published information uh, using the data manifest, so we can, I mean, even if you have to check that uh, periodically, but we uh, call that a subscription. How is that? Okay. Okay. There's no automatic way for this one. We have to check that automatically, I mean, uh, period periodically. I think there is a, I mean, I mean, current, uh, I mean, way of NDN. There is the NDN way for now. And is the chat being saved? Yeah, okay. that, that's another question on okay. your presentation. <laughs> okay, I'm copying. Okay. No, no. And, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, great. Are there any other questions? Okay, yeah, thanks again. Uh, looking forward to, um, to the software release. Um, and yeah, thanks for being at the meeting. Uh, we know it's it's not a convenient time for you. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much. It. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, so next, um, same time zone actually, um, is um, Kuangtung Tai um, on NDN based Ethereum blockchain. And I make you present her. Huh? So welcome, can, can you share your slides? Ah, okay, coming up. Uh, all right, can you hear me? Yes, what, we can hear you, but we're not seeing your slides. We're seeing some of uh, oh, All right, all right, all right. Okay, can you see it? Can you see it now? Not yet, at least not me. Not yet? Hold on. So the sharing worked, but you were not sharing the right window. Yeah, okay, now we can see it. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, very good. All right, can I start now? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, all right, the topic is NEN based Ethereum blockchain. So basically, I'm going to explain how we design the blockchain system for the NEN network. And uh, so we start with the motivations. So, we believe that blockchain may, play, may have many potential use cases, especially when we think about the decentralized internet. And probably blockchain may play, play some uh, uh, important role. For example, we can see application like uh, name resolution system or identity, identity management, or even for the PKI system, we can use blockchain system. But right now we don't have, any blockchain system for the ICN. So that's the reason we want to develop the first blockchain system for the ICN, uh, most specifically for the NDN network. And when we see the blockchain system on the uh, IP network, we see some problem, especially at the transport layer, because as a data propagation traffic in the blockchain network is highly redundant. Usually we we send multiple copies of the same 
data in the network. And we believe that the blockchain technology can take some benefits from the ICN. So we want to develop the first functioning blockchain on NDN in order to support the decentralized applications. Uh, and of course, we want to support the uh, NDN based blockchain research because when we move the blockchain system from the IP network to the NDN network, we change the communication model. So basically, we, we may have some new problems. For example, in uh, we may have some new consensus protocol for the uh, design specifically for the NDN network, or we may have some security issues with the blockchain system over the NDN. And uh, another Another reason we want to develop the uh, our blockchain system is to we want to experience the development of the NDN application, and we we want to see what kind of thing we need to change in order to have a better supporting of the blockchain like distributed systems. And obviously, we cannot develop the our blockchain system from scratch. We we have to base our development on some existing systems. So we have several options like uh, Bitcoin or Hyperledger or Ethereum. So in the end, we select Ethereum because uh, of several reasons. Uh, because uh, uh, the first is that uh, Ethereum supports the smart contract and uh, which may have many potential use cases. And uh, currently the, in the eco, uh, Ethereum ecosystem, there, there have been a lot of decentralized applications. And the Ethereum network it has been working securely for many years, and the source code is very stable, optimized, and it is well supported by uh, some big community. And uh, uh, also, the Ethereum platform is very popular for the acad academic research. And, uh, but how, uh, here I'm going to explain how the data is propagated in the uh, Ethereum blockchain network. So basically the blockchain system is a distributed, uh, a re replicated system. So every node try to have the same set of data. So everything have to be broadcast in the blockchain network. So uh, usually they use the uh, Gatship protocol to broadcast the data over the peer-to-peer -peer overlay. So in Ethereum, they use the Kademnia uh, distributed hash table to construct the peer-to-peer uh, -peer overlay. And from the drops of the Kademnia, they're going to select several peer randomly, and then they try to establish the TCP connection to those peers, and they are going to do state synchronization with the peers. So uh, when a node have a new data, for example, like they have a new transaction or new blocks, they're going to send the transaction or send the block to the other peer. But if the data is small, the data is pushed directly to the other peer. But if the data is large, usually they push it to some a small number of peer, and for the re remaining peer, they just announce the identity of the data, and then the other peer have to request for downloading the data. So uh, you can see that in this um, uh, data propagation model, we have a lot of traffic redundancy because uh, the many copies of the same object are sent and received on the network. And uh, in the case that you, you announce the data and the other node have to download it from you, so sometimes uh, it can take very long distance to download the object, the data. So we can see some problems. We, we can easily see many problems with the uh, transport layer of the blockchain network in a uh, blockchain system in the IP network. And uh, so we, we want to design a blockchain system for the NDN uh, network. So 
when we start to design our blockchain, we have several concerns. So, as you can see, that the uh, the data propagation in the blockchain system is as similar to the data synchronization problem, and we already have several protocols such as the chronosync, pre-sync, or vector syncs. So, our first question is whether we can use the protocol for our system. And the second second question is uh, whether we can use we we do we need the peer to peer overlay for the NDN based blockchain. So we analyze the uh, the protocols and we come to a conclusion that we cannot use existing protocols. It's due to several reasons because uh, the the first reason is that uh, in a blockchain system. Uh, we we expecting that node can come and leave, and we 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 do not manage the man, man, membership of the uh, of the node in the system. But in the existing protocol, for example, like Chronosync, usually you need to manage the uh, who is in the, who is joining the group, and the re the reason is that because they the, they model the state of the the system based on the state of each individual in uh, based on the, the, the state of every member. So they need a uh, membership management. And in the blockchain system, we, we cannot allow such kind of membership man management. And the second problem is about these uh, scalability issues. And because in, for example, in Chronosync, you have to use the Internet multicast. But when a uh, when a node uh, in the uh, chronosync want to broadcast its state, it have to use the it going to send an interest um, message, and the the internet message have to be multicast to every other member of the group. And in order to do so, all the NFT have to enable the uh, multicast strategy. So I we believe that is not a feasible assumption for the blockchain system. And the the last uh, issue is that um, the existing protocol was not designed for the system that have malicious nodes. For example, if if a malicious node sends some invalid state and then the it can cause all the, the other uh, nodes in the Chronosync system to stop for state reconciliation. So we believe that is is uh, in a in a blockchain system is it's not acceptable. So we think that we cannot use the existing protocol for the uh, blockchain system. And for the second que question is whether we can uh, do we need to use a peer to peer overlay. And I think we, we still need, need the peer-to-peer -peer overlay for the blockchain system because in a blockchain system, when you receive a data, you really have to validate the data before you propagate the data to the, the other peers. But it, uh, so because we, we are expecting that in the, in, in the blockchain system, we have some malicious node, nodes and they can send the invalid data. If, so. If they send the invalid data, the the, the data are going to be blocked at the honest node of the network. So, uh, so how we designed our blockchain system for the NDN? So, the assumption is that uh, every node in the blockchain system must have a routable prefix because uh, in the blockchain node have to be a consumer and producer at the same time. So they must have a routable prefix. And in order to enable the in-network caching and internet aggregation, we need to name the all the data object. Right? We need the data object, we need to give the data object a globally unique names. And uh, uh, but if uh, and also the name has to be location independent. So 
if we have the name with uh, location independent, uh, how can we forward the uh, the internet to the producer? So in in order to do so, we have to put the we have to separate the object name from the forwarding information. So we're going to put the forwarding information in the forwarding hand of the interest. So we, we use the announce and pull data broadcasting scheme for data, for broadcasting the, the data in the blockchain system. So basically, when a node have a new data, he uh, it's going to announce the identity of the object to the peer-to-peer -peer overlay, and then uh, the the other peer when they receive the announcement, they're going to request for the data directly from the announcer, and the node going to validate the data before the forward before forward the data to the other node. So. Invalid data is not from the whole network. So in this slide, I'm going to explain uh, a little bit more detail about how the announce and pull bro data broadcasting works. So uh, uh, basically, in the in in the figure, you can see that for for example, when the the peer zero uh, have a new data, like he has a new block or new transaction. You're going to announce the data to the other peer for the, the peer one and peer two, and uh, he's going to use an internet packet, and they he uh, embed the object identity in the internet packet and send it to the other peer, and the based on the uh, the the uh, announcement, the other peer going to uh, uh, Create a name for the uh, for the data packet, and they send a request to the announcer and to request the data because the uh, because every data object have, have a unique identity, and all the internet is going to have the same name. So we're going to have the internet uh, aggregations. So uh, announcer receives the internet. He's going to send the data back to the network and the data got, uh, is multicast to the OD requester. So when the other peer receives the data, they have to validate it before announced to the other peer. OK, so in this figure, I'm going to explain the idea a little bit in more detail. So for example, in in, in in this figure, we have the uh, a network of five, uh, four domains, and we have uh, one blockchain node at the uh, entry domain. So it have a, a node name like it, entry slash depth net Bob. And when he got a new block, he's going to announce the block to the the other peer, for example, a, the Alice from UCLA, so he sends an interest. So in interest packet, in 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 these interest packets, he have to include the his identity and I mean the announcer identity and the block hash. So when Alice receives the announcement, she can uh, create a name for the for the data object and request the data from the announcer because. Uh, Alice already know the the mapping between the block identity and his and and host name, so he can use she can use that information to put it in the forwarding hand of the interest, so that the interest can be uh, route to the announcer. So. Uh, as when the second peer request for the the same data, he uh, he going to get it from the uh, NFT. So we implement our blockchain system uh, on the 
in the end, so uh, actually we develop our system from the uh, Go Ethereum official, official client. And because right now uh, the uh, we and and the end community, community they do not support the uh, client library in Go language, so we have to develop a minimal Go and the end client, and we have to replace the peer to peer model in the existing Ethereum client by and the end by peer to peer model, and we designed and and implement all the uh, blockchain, um, all the block and transaction broadcasting and chain synchronization protocols. And we, uh, actually we finished implementation and we do some experiment on the, on our implementation. And I think that our uh, software is uh, quite stable now. And, uh, in this slide, I'm going to explain how we do some uh, performance evaluation of our blockchain system. So uh, we want to compare the performance of our system to our blockchain to the IP by Ethereum blockchain in terms of uh, traffic use. So uh, we set up a system of five domains and in, in each domain we have uh, from five to 20 blockchain nodes. And so in total, we have around 25 to 100 nodes. And uh, we, we're running the blockchain system and then we send some transaction at a constant rate. And then we measure the upstream and downstream traffic at every node and we're taking the average of the traffic. And we, we calculate two ratios. The first one is we call it the traffic redundancy ratio. So it's, it's uh, we take the traffic divided by the, the the size of the blockchain, and this, so this number is uh, the smaller is better, and uh, the second ratio is uh, the we call it the catching ratio. Actually, it's it's the uh, uh, we take the the downstream traffic minus the upstream traffic and divide by the downstream traffic. So this. This number is uh, uh, it's always smaller than one, and it, the bigger is the better. So uh, here I'm going to show some result of our experiment. So on the on the top we have two figures. Also on the on the left hand side is. Uh, uh, we plot the traffic. So you can see that in the the blue line is the, is the upstream and downstream traffic of the IP IP by blockchain. Because in in the uh, in the IP by blockchain, the upstream and downstream traffic are the same. And uh, the red line is for the end the end downstream traffic, and the orange line for the uh, upstream traffic and the popular is uh, the size of the blockchain. So if you if you can see that the uh, that there are a lot of uh, re reduction in the in terms of traffic use in the any end based blockchain. So if we take the ratio, we can see that in uh, uh, for example, like in in IP network, if we want to produce one megabyte of blockchain, we're going to uh, we need to send around nine megabyte of traffic and receive around nine megabyte of traffic. But on the end end uh, based blockchain, we only need to send around less than two megabyte of uh, data and receive less than four megabyte of data. So in total, we reduce around you know, seventy percent of the traffic. On the any end based blockchain, and uh, on the uh, on the lower figures, we we show the caching efficiency in the any end based blockchain. So, on the left hand side, we we see the traffic, and you can see that the blue line is downstream traffic, and the the red line is the upstream traffic, and the the black line is the the size of the blockchain. So. So in 
uh, in the end end by uh, blockchain, we we are expecting that the 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 upstream traffic is always smaller than the downstream traffic because because of the 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 catching effect. So if we measure the catching ratio, we can have the result around more than fifty percent. All right. So uh, okay, I'm 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 going to go to the uh, some demo for our system first. All right. So okay, I'm 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 going to to show you the demo of our system. So basically, uh, I have a system of. Uh, uh, 100 blockchain nodes running on five domains. Actually, I set up these five domains on five servers. And uh, I'm going to to run the demo on a, another server. And from this server, I'm going to uh, create some blockchain network and connect to the existing uh, network. Can you see my video? Okay. So can you see the video? Can you see it? No? Um, sorry, I wasn't. So you don't seem to be sharing any window right now. Um, maybe you have to set it up again. Right. Yeah, something is happening. Yeah, you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, so first, I'm. Um, I'm going to start running the blockchain network of 100 nodes on five domains. And then I'm going to attach to one of the nodes to see, to monitor the, the node. At, as you can see that you know, when I connect to the node, I can see that the, the node right now have around 80,878 blocks. And then I connect to another node. And I can see that uh, they have the same number of nodes, as you can see. And then I move to the uh, another window. I, I start a new node. OK, so is it not go going to connect to the other uh, node on the existing uh, network? And it also. Now it did not have around more than one one block more than the other node, so they need some synchronization. So you can see that now the block number are the same. And then I'm going to start another node. All right, now you can see that. Uh, all the nodes have the same number of the block. And you can see the uh, the content of some block. And they must be identical. All right. So now I am going to create a brand new node. So let me delete all the previous data. And then um, here I'm going to, to generate a new node. So basically, I, I have, we have to give the information of the first block, the Genesis block of the blockchain, 
So we Okay, so in order for the node to connect to the network, it needs to place information of one existing node. So we call it the boot node. So the boot node has the uh, has a has the NDN name like this. So now we are going to copy the boot node to the data directory of the the new node, and then we start the new blockchain node. And it starts to connect to the networks. And right now it have only single block. So it have to download all the block from the other peer. So it usually takes several minutes to finish downloading all the block from the other peer. So in the meantime, I'm going to send some transaction to the network. So basically in, uh, I'm going to send five transactions to some node on in the network. Okay, so so then I, I can check these uh, the the pending transaction of uh, in each uh, blockchain net uh, each blockchain node. We can see that we have five pending transaction. And let me send another batch of transaction. Now we, we send the trans transaction to another node and we're going to receive the transaction. So now we have the 10 pending transaction, right? And now I'm going to send the transaction directly to one of the, the, the lower, lower left node. And you can see that it's going to receive transaction. So I, I send five transactions to this node and uh, basically uh, the other node going to request the transaction from this node. But you can see here only, uh, we, we have only five transaction requests. So it means that the, the interest was aggregate in the NFT. So, so the the node go is receive exactly receive exactly only one request for each transaction. Okay, so now we have fifteen transaction, and now. I'm going to start mining on one of the nodes because right now there's no miner in the blockchain network. So the, 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 the transaction is not uh, written to the block. So we, we have to start one miner so that the miner can create block and in, include the transaction into the block. So I'm going to start a miner. Okay, he's going to start to mine the new block and it takes several minutes, uh, several seconds. And all right, so we have to wait a little bit. Okay, in the meantime, I'm going to send out some other transaction to the network. All right, and now if you look to the the lower right corner, you can see that the this the node uh, has finished synchronization. So okay, now this node has the same number of block as the other node because he, he already finished synchronization. And okay, the, the miner already uh, filed a new block and you can see that the other node uh, has requested the block and they fetch the block number uh, 18,880. 18, 18, you can see that they, they fetch the block from the miners. And 
what it see here is you have only one request at the minor. It means that the, the request have been the interest has been aggregated. All right, so so I think that is for the demo of our blockchain system. All right, so let's go back to the All right. So, do you see my see the my screen now? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, in conclusion, we can see that in uh, the NN by blockchain, we can reduce traffic, and uh, we plan to have more tests on the uh, the, the test network for the latency measurement because right now we we cannot measure the latency of the NN based blockchain and compare it to the IP based blockchain. So we, we plan to have that as a, as a more tests later, and we plan to publish our uh, software at the open source package. All right, and one of the things that we we are concerning is whether we 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 use the we put the announcement in the interest packet. Where we 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 wondering whether it's a appropriate 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 way to to send the data in the in the ICN or not. So probably we, we, we're gonna have some feedback from the other guy who working on the NDN. And I think that is for my presentation. All right. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Okay. Thanks for preparing this demo. Uh, so, All right. It's so, so cool to see. Um, yes, we, we have time for uh, say one or two questions. We're running a bit late. So I think um, this was really interesting. Um, so in terms of the design decisions that you uh, took for the protocol. Um, so if there are no questions now, um, I think what would be really nice if uh, you could maybe write up um, your design maybe in a Something like a spec or a paper it doesn't have to be a draft necessarily, but um, I think that would help people to um, understand it and um, yeah, have a, a good discussion with you. All right. But um, so in in general, um, I think many people have been looking forward to this because I mean, um, yeah, we always had the intuition that um, while well, these gossip protocols are really inefficient and um, so an ICN based approach uh, seems to be um suitable and so yours is uh say yeah one of the first um yeah really experimental approaches so that's really good that you really built the system and uh were able to test it so that was really nice to see all right thank you so um i hope you are you, know, you are on the uh, ic energy mailing list um so that, that may be good for you to get more questions Yes, I, 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 all right. I, I, I see a question about do we have a paper on the ATM works? You mean the paper about the our design of the blockchain system? Yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, actually, we we are preparing the the paper and and I I think we we will try to complete it very soon. Great. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you very much again. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, we're running a bit late, but this was super interesting. Um, and um, it's going to be um, interesting for the next presentation as well. Um, so we have uh, Toru Hasegawa. Um, also, uh, from a very inconvenient time zone. Um, I Apologies for uh, um, not optimizing the agenda for that, uh, I realize. Um, Toro, I made you a presenter.
Yes, sure. Okay, I will uh, share the mic slides. Okay, can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Okay. Uh, hello, so uh, this is Dora Sierra, so from Osaka University. So uh, today's presentation is a joint work with the uh, Osaka University and the uh, UCL. Uh, today's uh, talk uh, is the summary of the our published paper uh, on your routing, uh, which is published in the ITV transactions on network and service management of this areas. Okay, so our presentation focus on the producer anonymity. So uh, currently, so there are a couple uh, definitions for anonymity. One is the uh, consumer anonymity. Uh, the other one is the uh, producer anonymity. So uh, consumer anonymity means that the uh, adversaries cannot run who requests some specific content. And so producer anonymity means that adversaries cannot run who publishes some specific content. So uh, today's topics focus on producer anonymity. So uh, which uh, possible uh, scenarios of the these two types of anonymity is that the one is the uh, privacy sensitive privacy sensitive application like location based services. The other is the uh, censorship evasion. So uh, maybe so our target is the censorship, censorship, censorship evasion and maybe location-based services. Okay. So in the literature, so consumer anonymity and the pro produce anonymity were addressed uh, several studies. The uh, most important one is the Andana. Uh, which was de developed by UCI. So uh, this is the uh, this work was inspired inspired by onion routing in IP. Uh, this is the uh, maybe so uh, Torah in at uh, MDN networks. So uh, Chris B is also the uh, uh, provides consumability, but it's not onion routing. So it is the to be best. So our work is our uh, extension to Andana. So as our provides produce anonymity through the uh, NDN attribute based signature address anonymity producer anonymity. However, uh, this this study only handles the leakage only from these signatures. Uh, this is not insufficient to completely achieve the uh, producer anonymity. So, uh, in the in my talk, so first we briefly explain and that then uh, we explain how to add uh, to uh, our producer anonymity protocol. And then is the uh, consumer anonymity uh, routing for. Uh, Consumer anonymity. So, and then uh, the, uh, the this type of adversaries. Adversaries evade drop packets on compromised network entities and allow us to trace their origins. So, and uh, tries to uh, break the uh, consumers and the uh, producers. The this uh, the, this figure shows the uh, system overview of Andana. In Andana, a consumer chooses a series of two anonymized routers. A uh, a series of the uh, anonym, anonymizing routers called a circuit. Then. A consumer shares the uh, encrypt uh, secret keys, both anonymizing router. This is the first step. The consumer issues internet packets uh, whose name is 
encapsulated in multiple layers of secret key encryption around the circuit. It is very similar to the uh, Tor. Uh, uh, it's just a uh, onion routing. Then uh, each analyzing router decrypts the uh, interest packet, then what to the next anonymized routers? Uh, packet is uh, back to the uh, consumer via the reverse first. So, Anandana is very similar to Tor in IP. However, uh, Andana has the one good advantage over Tor in IP. Andana achieves the a similar level of, uh, a level of anonym, anonymity comparable to Tor with one fewer one fewer uh, anonym, anonym routers. Uh, uh, precisely, uh, uh, Tor needs three maybe three anonym routers to provide the consumer anonymity. Uh, on the contrary, with Tor and just two anonymizing router, uh, two anonymizing routers are enough. Uh, this is why uh, Andana liberates the uh, NDN. I mean that's in NDN, so NDN packet, internet packets do not have any address, I mean, any IP address. So if the top anonymizing router uh, checks the uh, to get. Okay, anyway. Uh, simply in Tor, Tor use three anonymizing routers. In Andana, this first of anonymizing router is needed because the uh, interest and the packets do not have any uh, physical uh, IP addresses. So. Okay. Oh, okay, so we focus on this advantage of uh, Andana. So we extend the Andana to uh, onion routing plot for consumer anonymity. So uh, this anonymity in NG, in, in, NG net, in NG networks is very similar to receiver anonymity in IP network. However, uh, this anonymity is a little bit different from the receiver anonymity in IP. So, uh, we should consider the uh content name and the signature so well, anyway so uh, we uh we carefully consider the adversaries so in in, in the network so adversaries can correlate content and its producer these type of in pieces uh, one is the packet route. This is similar to the uh, IP. So, if adversaries are compromised, the uh, anonymized several anonymizing routers, so adversaries can the root can uh, can uh, divide the root, then so identify producer. Another source of information is the content name and signature. So in NDN, uh, the bindings between producer identity, producer identity, name, and public key are established so that uh, consumers can verify the provenance of content. Then so, uh, 
some of the uh, private information inherently is inherently leaked from the signature or producer's name. So, uh, we uh, we design the uh, onion routing protocol for producer limiting by uh, taking into account these uh, leakage of information. So the goals of the uh, protocol are twofold. One is the uh, design designer uh, system that achieves the producer anonymity against adversaries who leverage content names, signature, and packet root. Anyway, uh, the other goal is to, we would, we would like to leverage the MD like Andana. So our approach is not to forget. One is the, uh, uh, our design based on the hidden service in, hidden service in IP. So uh, we prevent from leakage from the uh, content and signature also. Uh, we want to prevent information leakage from the package. Uh, the other approach uh, is the, uh, we leverage the uh, anonymity offered by in-network. Maybe so uh, we use the, uh, we leverage the lines. Uh, we use the four-way handshake Lies. Uh, anyway, so uh, lies provides some kind of anonymity. So we invest the, uh, the this feature of the lies. So this is the uh, overview of our protocols. Anyway, our protocol consists of five 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 protocol five protocols five uh, procedures. The first one is the uh, onion name. So, so the first uh, first pass mechanism is that so a producer generates the her his pseudonym called the onion name. On name is the uh, not identifier. I mean, uh, it's not okay. Second one is the uh, produce uh, producer ask them, uh Anonymizing a router, anonymizing a router to act as a rendezvous point. The first of anonymizing a router acts as a rendezvous point between the uh, consumer and producer. So, third one is uh, the producer approach her, her his descriptor to several anonymizing routers called uh, descriptor directories. This is similar. Uh, this is the same as the that of, this is the same as the Tor uh, no, hidden service in IP. Sorry. So first is the uh, consumer uh, who runs the onion name in some out of band way, downloads the descriptor. Then so uh, consumer knows the uh, uh, onion name of the uh, content which he wants. Then, sir, the consumer uh, the con content name is con uh, the consumer is is issues content request request specify the onion name through the label point. Then, uh, uh, content is uh, retrieved retrieved uh, retrieved uh, retrieved by from the producer. So. Uh, next several slides shows the uh, details of the uh, protocols. I will skip some of them. Okay, the first one is the on name. On your name is uh, the structure is like this. So, first component is the uh, reserved word. This is the on your name. The second one is the uh, hash values of the uh, public key ID of the uh, producer. 
uh, third one is the suffix. Suffix, uh, this is the uh, content name. So, uh, publisher, Okay. 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 Never been by. So, uh, anyways, so this type of name uh, does not reveal information on the producer uh, because it's not. It is not rootable. Not the human user. So. This on your name is secure because it is the uh, self certifying. Okay. Uh, next, next one is the uh, rendezvous establishment. So, uh, the goal of the uh, rendezvous point establishment is uh, to, uh, anyway, the producer asks them, uh, an router to act as rendezvous point by sending or the onion name and self certified signature. Then, uh, anonymizing allowed to accept uh, it if hash, hash names contained in the onion name is valid for a uh, public key ID in the service case. So, uh, one of the problem is that the producers cannot send this element with the standard internet, internet data exchange. So, anyway, uh, we need some kind of the uh, anonymity. So. Uh, producers rootable root name must be hidden to all other entities to achieve producer anonymity. So then, so we liberate the uh, lies. So I will skip the uh, lies protocols. Then, so uh, this is the uh, procedure of the rendezvous point establishment. So this is the rendezvous point. So uh, this. For way is the lies. So a producer sends the his name to the rendezvous point. Then so a uh, rendezvous point uh, uh, sends the uh, interest packets from the uh, the consumer like this. Then so a producer push the data. So uh, in that case, we use the. Uh, uh, encryption encryption then so uh, internet anonymizing routers does not know who are sender or who are receiver by using the lies so we provide some uh, some kind of the anonymity between the producers and run the points so uh, we use uh, this kind of mechanism to uh, between the uh, anonymous, anonymous routers. Then, okay, so we don't have so much time, so, okay, we will, we will skip the uh, details of the protocols, so, so anyway, I, I skip the uh, descriptor publication retriever. So, anyway, after the uh, Encryption keeps are by the producer, the routers, and uh, rendezvous points. Uh, again, the allies. For example, the producer sends the first interest pack to the rendezvous point anonymously. The consumer sends the uh, request to the producer. At that time, sir. Uh, rendezvous point sends the second interest packet of the lies to the consumer, then producer uh, push the contents to the rendezvous point, like the uh, lies. Then so the result is returned to the consumer. And finally, uh, acknowledgement returned back to the producer. So by using the lies and uh, encryption keys, uh, consumer, uh, consumer or uh, cannot know who are the producers. Okay. 
So anyway, so currently, so we we are implementing the uh, this protocol. Uh, so this is the uh, sample of the uh, preliminary evaluation of the uh, performance. Uh, this slide shows the uh, overheads of the uh, encryption of the packets are not so large. Also, uh, important thing, important in the important of the uh, our uh, product anonymity protocol is add to fold it. One is the uh, fewer hops. The number of the number of hops is smaller than uh, produce anonymity protocol in IP. The other is the uh, our protocol or uh, is more resilient against predecessor attack in IP uh, predecessor attack than Tor in IP. So predecessor attack is the a very uh, strong attack in uh, onion routing. So if adversary is the a couple of the uh, routers, okay, uh, and, okay, okay. So if a couple of uh, routers are uh, compromised by a consumer, uh, linkability of client and server is uh, broken. So in the Torah, uh, in the Torah, in, in hidden uh, services or uh, in IP. So the adversary uh, compromise the two routers. Okay, so I don't, okay, I'm sorry, uh, this is not so. In the Torah, so only one router, okay. The adversary must just run a uh, router. On the contrary, so in my protocol, so in our protocols, uh, adversary must compromise, compromise two routers. This one? Yeah, okay, okay, so uh for adversaries it is difficult it is more difficult for adversaries to compare compromise many routers so uh, our uh, our produce and matey protocol is more resilient than uh, predecessor attacks than uh Tor in ip so uh, currently so we are inviting we are implementing the, uh, this protocol on CEPRO, which is provided by NYST. So, okay. So, I spent almost a minute. So, this is, okay. Uh, that's the end of the, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toru. Mm -hmm. So there have been some questions uh, on the sure. chat, which sure. are partially answered by Yuki. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the first question was um, by Dave, is the onion name the same for everybody? And if so, can an adversary le learn anything by seeing the request for the same onion name? Uh, uh, um, okay. Uh, so you, Yuki already replied. I'm not sure you, you can see the chat right now. But... I will check. I, I'm checking. So, yeah. So, anyway, so, okay. Uh, so, we, uh, we, did, we did not check the uh, feather. Okay, uh, I, I think that this or uh, the same name you it, it name is used then so uh, maybe so is not resilient against the frequency attacks. But so we do not check the uh, feather uh, protocol is resilient against. Pre-kinch attack or not? So, 
as a question. Okay. Uh, yes, also uh, we need so some uh, outbound mechanisms to uh, send the onion. Yes. So we we plan to use this some kind of the uh, distinguish distinguish has table mechanisms, but uh, we did not. Uh, Precisely uh, 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 designed it, such out of band mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, just as a reference, um, I'm not sure uh, you are aware of um, the CCNX key exchange protocol that was um, presented in IC Energy years ago. Uh, uh. It could actually be used for setting up a TLS like um, security context. So currently, so uh, we use the very simple uh, DP Hellman type of the uh, protocol. So, so we can use the uh, CCNX key access protocol, but we did not check the whether we can use uh, this protocol or not. Yeah. Okay. It's just a pointer for you. Um, great. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much again. Appreciate it. And um, so we are moving on to our final presentation by uh, Cheng Gunwan. And I am like him presenter. Yeah, hi, Dirk. Uh, can you hear and see me? Yes, very well. Nice, great. Um, share. So, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. All right, then I will just start because I think we don't have that much time left. Um, uh, so, thank you, Dave and Dirk, for uh, yeah, having this uh, slot on, on the call. And this presentation is uh, mostly a recap and a continuation of the work that we did together with uh, Christian Amses, uh, Thomas Schmidt, Matthias Welich, and me for the ICN20 conference, um, where we built a Web of Things deployment. Uh, an RFC compliant Web of Things deployment that um, also displays uh, information centric uh, characteristics. And if you're interested in a more highly technical talk, then you can also look at the pre recorded video that is, I think, hosted on the ICN conference website um, on this topic. So, what does the Web of Things actually mean? Um, for me, a Web of Things is um, a deployment where we have constrained IoT devices. Um, they interconnect using a low power and lossy um, network, um, even in the multi op networks, to more powerful gateways. And these gateways have an uplink, com an uplink communication to cloud services. And of course, a paradigm that fits very well in this scenario is the REST paradigm. And there are like two very prominent protocols uh, for doing REST for deployments uh, on the side, um, on the cloud side. So between the cloud and the gateway, we have HTTP uh, using TCP. And on the uh, constrained IoT and the gateway side, we use CoApp. And of course, uh, how to secure such a deployment using transport layer security. Um, where we use TLS for HTTP because of TCP, and we use DTLS for co op because of UDP. So, a deployment uh, as this faces uh, many, many challenges. Um, I picked two of those and put on the slide. So, one is the network resilience um, in these deployments. There are many factors that can lead to deg degradation of uh, the, the resilience itself. Um, it may be cross traffic or radio interferences or other things like um, exhausted buffer space. And these leads to retransmissions um, on upper layers, in this case, for example, co op retransmissions, which then again uh, lead to more network stress. Um, because of the added uh, overhead, the packet overhead. And uh, since we are using an end-to-end -end communication here in CoAP, we see that, of course, uh, tr retransmissions have to traverse from the origin to, to the endpoint. Uh, so it has to traverse all the links again for each retransmission. Another problem is the end-to-end -end security. As soon as we have gateways that terminate uh, security, 
we have to also include them into the the trust uh, infrastructure so it, it gets more complicated to distribute the keys and um, to decide which gateway to trust or to not and of course um, especially in dtls we have this added overhead of creating or establishing a session for for iot nodes when they change um, endpoint information like ip address or ports we saw i mean there were like many um, research papers uh, in the previous years that that show that information centric properties uh, in this case table forwarding caching and object security can try to reduce the burdens um, of of the uh, of the problems we see uh, and face in those um, deployments for example the staple forwarding and caching they shorten the request path and reduce uh, link traversals on retransmissions and uh, the object security can help with the end-to-end -end security and we don't need to have uh, session establishments if the endpoint changes so we have this uh, paper at the ICN20 that I just mentioned, um, and there we try to figure out, okay, um, can we use the benefits of these ICN characteristics in co-app deployments? And we try to figure out the building blocks that we would need uh, to, to build such a thing. And we came up this, with this list. So if you look deeper in the co-app uh, communication model, then we see there's like a, a couple of uh, methods that co-app defines similarly to, to HTTP. So we have the co-op get method, uh, put, um, post, update, delete, and, and more. Uh, co-op get method is uh, the method that um, has the highest uh, similarity to an NDN or CCN uh, model using interest data. So here would be co-op get and the data that returns. And co-op also allows to have um, retransmissions for the requests. Uh, and returning data would be an acknowledgement, but uh, co-op also allows to have um, retransmission for responses, which need a separate uh, acknowledgement from the requestee. Uh, when we look at the, the, the standard RFC of co-op, we see that they define an entity called proxy uh, that forwards requests and that relay back data packets or responses the same way. So it's very similar to what NDN is doing anyway um, uh, when forwarding. So we basically store state uh, in the proxy and can um, send responses back on, on the path. And proxies also have the ability to do caching, which of course is very handy because NDN also is doing that. And then we have object security for, for CoAP, this is a um, relatively new RFC um, called OSCOR. It's from last year, July, I think. Uh, provides authenticated encryption and um, has methods or, or um, features like confidentiality, integrity, integrity uh, request response, uh, strong request response binding, and um, is doing replayability. Um, uh, or yeah, tries to to disallow replayability attacks. And so, with these building blocks, we asked ourselves, okay, what can we do with or what? How can we uh, form such a deployment? And what we did is we took a multi-hop um, topology and we configured each constrained IoT device in this uh, topology to be actually a core proxy that forward uh, requests. And then we enabled the caches and, of course, encrypted and, and authenticated all the, the messages using OSCOR. So on the right side, you see this figure um, where you can see a co-op get message that originates from, from the red node. This uh, get message is received by a forwarder. It creates state. It uh, then sends out a new get message to the next uh, forwarding node. And this repeats until we hit um, the content producer. And the content producer um, produces the content, which is then stored on, on each hop in the cache. If we have a loss, a packet loss, then we do the um, request retransmissions. And this looks very, very similar to what NDN is doing. We have caches along the way, and the caches can um, fulfill the requests. Um, yeah, the request. 
So if you look at the, the network stack itself, how it looks like, we can see on the left side the CCNX and NDN uh, stack. Um, in this case, we use an adaptation layer. Um, here it's ICN Lopen. And on the right hand side, you see the new network stack, or I mean, the, the ITF envisioned network stacks for, for the IoT using co op um, based on UDP, IPv6, and 6 Lopen. And on the application layer, we have now co op. Um, using proxies and, and OSCore. And what we now do is we basically rebuild the things uh, that we had on the network layer for the CCN and NDN stack um, on the application layer. And now we, since Coop is uh, using uh, URIs to, to request and, and the, to return the content, we have uh, forwarding uh, based on names, which is also a similarity to a CCN and NDN. But we have, of course, um, be uh, yeah. I mean, we have to be careful because <laughs> in Coop um, we don't have static content, so name in, a name or a request can return different content. For example, uh, different temperature values. Here's actually a, b a bonus um, thing that or th something that surprised me when I when I built the system and. Um, yeah, did the experimentation. I looked in the PCAP files, and I saw that actually the the core packets got uh, much smaller. And I asked or looked at the PCAP files and tried to find out why. And the interesting thing is that IPv6 compresses IP uh, source and destination addresses if they are link local addresses. And I used link local because we have this chain of forward uh, forwarders, proxy forwarders. So we don't need to use uh, the global IPv6 addresses, but the link local addresses. And um, if you use a link local IPv6 link local address that derives from a MAC address, then the uh, 6Open even omits the full IPv6 um, addresses, the source and destination address, so we can save 32 bytes. So there are benefits. If we build a co-op that has uh, these um, characteristics, we have improved resilience, and, and we showed this in the paper. Uh, you can look at the paper or the video uh, for the plots and, and uh, information. It has a reduced latency, and um, it is, of course, uh, there's a location independence of data, like in NDN. But then uh, we asked, do we also gain like insights that we can use for the CCN or NDN world? And uh, this is something that we uh, not really highlighted in the paper itself, but um, we summarized a little bit and things that we came up with, um, okay, there's an early deployment chance if we have an ICN or a co-op that's uh, like an ICN, we could actually use caching strategies or forwarding strategies that are like um, that are uh, designed for an NDN. Why not use that in, in co-op deployments, which are already running? Um, and then there are two features that uh, co-op implements and, and um, yeah, also like um, uh, mentions in the RFC. For example, there's like the response acknowledgements. Um, so what if we can uh, transfer that from the co-op to, to NDN? What if we do uh, retransmissions and acknowledgements for data packets also to make a more robust system? Uh, there are some initial measurements that we did uh, that show if um, we lose requests or if we actually, uh, we could use early acknowledgements for retransmissions, for request retransmissions to stop the retransmission um, on each hop for requests. But then we have, I mean, then we need uh, response uh, acknowledgements because then we can uh, put, uh, no, send back the, the response as soon as we have the, the data instead of being pulled by the retransmissions. Uh, but of course, then we need the response, uh, retransmission, and acknowledgement in case that uh, gets lost. And there's also the efficient uh, cache revalidation using an e tag in, in Co op. It's very similar to what HTTP is doing. So if we have a cache uh, with stale cache entries and an interest um, uh, tries to get a content from that cache, um, the, the cache or the node can actually ask the the producer of that of that content if the data is still fresh, um, and it can do so by sending an e tag, and the content origin then just replies with yes or no instead of sending back the the full data. 
so we also have uh, ongoing efforts and we are mostly interested in the multicast um, because CCNX and NDN inherently support the, the multicast um, um, and we might be able to also transfer that to, to co-op itself. Uh, NDN is of course uh, using request aggregation and response deduplication and um, why not you also use that for co-op. Uh, I think it is should be quite easy to do this for uh, content that is static, but it's probably more complicated for content that changes. Um, yeah, so the then the next uh, step would be to evaluate uh, group communication. I mean, the protected group communication, for example, using group OSCOR, and see how that works out in or I mean, in this kind of uh, co-op deployments. And how does it affect the caches um, of protected meta or the cacheability of protected messages? So that was uh, quite quick, and we still have time for questions. And if there are any questions, yes, absolutely. We, thanks and, so much, uh, Shai. Yeah. Thank um, you also. So that's um, so I would really appreciate um, that you. Um, picked up the, the um, nice discussion at the ICN conference and uh, came back with, with a follow-up presentation. That's exactly what we had hoped for. So um, thanks, that was uh, really nice. Um, so are there any questions? So while people are still thinking about the questions, um, so I, I will repeat my comment from the conference. So, um, so if you can go back to slide um, six, for example. Here. Uh, no, uh, no, it wasn't six. Um, maybe move forward. Um, so just one where you show the network. Uh, maybe this one is, is fine, actually. Yeah, this one. Um, so I'm not sure we are really um, comparing apples to apples here, um, because it seems to me that in this um, co-op um, network here, you have something like like a pre-configured proxy chain. So um, in, yeah. in, in, in the end approach, you would probably, I mean, as for example, in, in, you, in your other paper, um, in the end, in the wild and for IT, IoT, mm -hmm. um, you would have a, maybe a, like a forwarding claim that is able to um, you know, find uh, next hops uh, itself and so on. Mm -hmm. That probably would be difficult in core, I guess, unless you re you reinvented all the the ICN semantics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that's true. I mean, at least for um, the evaluations of this of this paper, we used, like you said, a pre-configured um, forward chain. Um, but I think it should be quite easy to have a like a discovery protocol that um, tries to I mean there are for example discovery protocols in co-op itself using like a resource directory I'm not yet sure how we would be able to integrate this into these kind of deployments um, but I don't see huge showstoppers I mean yeah I mean there of course we need to think about this whether it would work to have a dynamic topology management yeah. um, to find the correct proxy, the forward proxy. Mm. And then so... I have one question. Uh, yeah, okay. To what extent do you think the immutability properties that we tend to hold dear in ICN uh, affect some of these design decisions? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So. Um, I mean, of course, it has a huge uh, impact on, on the caching because <clears throat> if we say that we um, now allow, for example, data that is mutable, uh, we can't really do caching. I mean, or at least we have uh, have to have versions or timestamping um, to, to request old state of, of the data. Um, there's also the problem of, um, f at least for the protection, um, the OSCOR, for example, puts uh, counters and, and uh, sequence numbers into, into um, the security envelope. So also there it would be um, kind of hard if we have multiple content because then we have uh, different uh, signatures and, uh, and whatnot. So I think 
I mean, the system that uh, that is there, that is in the paper, of course, works out of the box for content that's Im uh, immutable. As soon as we go to immutable content, I mean, I think that we need more more thoughts or you yeah, need to make more. Maybe there might be also be more discussion on this. I'm also not yet sure if. I mean, it's probably yeah. I mean, it's of course use case dependent. Uh, NDN is doing that apparently. I mean, without um, uh, mutability in coop, we need that. Depending on the use case, I'm not yet sure which is the way to go. Okay. And um, so regarding your um, potential future directions, um, I mean, one what, say one outcome of this could, so it could be that in your end, you basically re-implement um, the, the ICM node behavior mostly, um, but you're just using co-op as a you know, different packet format or convergence layer if you want. Um, yeah. So would, is there still value? I mean, I mean, I think the value then is that okay, you can run this over co-op networks. Yeah. Um, I mean, this re-implementation, I'm not yet so sure about because everything we used up until now is RFC compliant. So I mean, it's already there. The building blocks um, that co-op provides us allowed us mm -hmm. to, to to build such kind of systems. And why not use these things? I mean, I don't think that um, when the designers of of co-op made the specification. I don't think that they had the intention of uh, using, for example, proxies on, on every hop of the network. No. This is just something that, I mean, makes the system very uh, similar to NDN, mm. um, but it is still I mean, protocol compliant. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not yet sure what we need. I mean, what, what extra stuff we need to, if you want to keep, um, if you want to make it further more like ICN, what else we need. Um, yeah, let's see, I mean. Yeah, I was more thinking about what you could pitch as opposed to what you could add. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a was... lot of what you talked about with retransmissions and acting data um, seem to me to be oriented toward reclaiming buffer space um, in the intermediaries. Mm -hmm. um, whereas hop by hop retransmission of interests in, um, in ICN um, kind of obviates that and your cache management is based only on arrival of data. That's that's true. Yeah, I mean, there's this this one use case I try to highlight here. Um, retransmission also costs, of course, uh, bandwidth, and, and they of, also reduce uh, radio interference. If we can reduce that, uh, why not? But then we have the problem. I mean, as you said, then we have to have uh, data acknowledgments, uh, but there's currently no way in NDN. I mean, there's no data type, for example, to 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 do this. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think. Um... Well, I would I would mention it's easy to it's easy to produce hop by hop acknowledgments for NDN, right? The question is, what would an uh, an end to end acknowledgement doesn't really make any sense because then the producers know things like consumer count and, um, you know. What does it mean when a, to acknowledge a data that may have reached, you know, a hundred consumers? What does that acknowledgement mean? It's this, it's got, it seems to have all the same problems as multicast acknowledgements, mm -hmm. like explosion problems. Yeah. Uh... I mean, was it actually, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, um, I think this is an interesting direction, and I mean, we are looking at you know looking at this IoT space from different perspective. I mean, the other perspective is certainly to um, you know uh, build something from the ground up um, that you know does what IoT applications need um, without the, any legacy. And um, so, I, I think it's going to be interesting to to kind of keep, compare these two tracks at least. 
Um, okay, good. Thanks again, Shank. Yeah, thank you also. Wait, one second. Yeah, okay, this um, brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for um, staying for so, so long. Um, we actually didn't expect that we um, really fill these uh, three hours, uh, but um, we did. Um, and next time we should plan in a break if, if we take that long or split it up into two meetings. Um, but in any way, that was really interesting. Um, thanks everybody um, for presenting and uh, for participating in the discussion. Mm, just a few things. Um, so, um, yeah, let's continue use, uh, using the mailing list for, for technical discussions um, as well. So um, I think there were probably some questions um, raised today that we didn't answer. And um, so I think that's still a good good way to, to discuss this. Um, other than that, um, we used to have an effort for organizing a draft review, so uh, like an online spreadsheet. Um, I think Dave and I will have to revive this and send a message about that. Um, future meetings, so uh, as you can imagine, um, we're probably not going to meet face to face anytime soon. So there will be more online meetings. Um, if you have any ideas or also feedback regarding today, um, so what, how to, you know, do things differently, um, please talk to us. So one thing that um, we hope we'll do soon is um, another focused meeting on Flick, as uh, Christian mentioned um, in the beginning. And um, so yeah, we'll, let's, we will announce this, of course, and everyone is uh, would be welcome to attend that. Okay, um, other than that, um, thanks again. And uh, yeah, please stay safe, everybody, and hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.